Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 4. My name is Lauren, and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, moderator Amy, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, Kate will be talking with English language specialist Rosa Dean David about universal design for learning and how this approach can affect student motivation in the EFL classroom. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Kate, as Lauren said, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Welcome, welcome, and Happy New Year. Um, uh, I'm Kate, and I work here in the Office of English Language Programs in Washington, DC. And we're so thrilled to see people today from all over the world joining our first session in the fourth series of American English Live. So thank you so much for being here. Of course, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to any first-time viewers. Do we have any first-time viewers? Let us know in the chat box if this is the first time you've been to one of our American English live or webinar events. And welcome back to all of you who have been with us for many other series. Let us know as well how many webinars or Facebook Live or American English Live events you've joined us for. So it's great to be with you all. Let's start with these American English Live viewing group photos featuring teachers from around the world participating in viewing sessions during series three. We love to see teachers learning and sharing ideas as they view our sessions. So please share your photos of viewing groups or even of yourself um, viewing one of our sessions by emailing them to the email address there on your screen, American English Webinars at elprograms.org. You can also share your photos by tagging us on social media um, at American English for Educators or hashtag American English. We may feature one of your photos in the next session. Let's review our exciting lineup for this series. Our presentations this series are focused on increasing learner motivation, content-based instruction, and communicative grammar teaching. Today is our first session in series four, and we look forward to learning with you throughout this series. We'll go over more details at the end of this session, so stay tuned. So here's a little bit about what to expect. Each session is approximately 60 minutes long and is often related to a teacher's corner theme on the American English website or an upcoming American English eTeacher Massive Open Online course or MOOC. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience. So please share your questions and comments and let us know about your context so that we can um, say hello and address all of your questions and needs during today's session. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and we're going to, which will have a short quiz for today's session. You must answer two out of three questions correctly um, don't worry, it's not too difficult. If you're able to join us for the whole session, you should have no trouble. Once you've successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to receive your badge from, by email from AmericanEnglishAtState.gov in about a week. And finally, before we begin, we'd like to announce an upcoming massive open online course through the American English eTeacher program. This course is called Content-Based Instruction. This free course is designed for teachers who currently teach or may soon teach content-based instruction. For this course, CBI, or content-based instruction, is defined as instruction where the content, which could be math, history, science, etc., is taught in a language that the students are learning. In this case, they're learning English, of course. CBI courses present teachers with the challenge of balancing the teaching of both language and content. In this MOOC, in this free online course, you will gather the tools you need to successfully address the challenges of balancing both language and content teaching in the classroom. Sounds really interesting. I hope to see many of you there. So enrollment for this course begins next week on January 14th, and the orientation for the course begins on February um, 11th with the online course beginning on the 18th. You can go to the link listed there, www.aeeteacher.org 
forward slash MOOC for more information. And of course, on January 14th, you can go right there to sign up for this free course. And now for today's session, increase student motivation with universal design in mind. In this session, we will learn about how to promote universal design for learning, UDL and inclusive teaching strategies to ensure that language learners receive meaningful and accessible instruction that recognizes the diverse strengths and weaknesses that students bring to the classroom. UDL incorporates a variety of teaching approaches to remove barriers that students may face in understanding classroom instruction, promoting equal opportunities for student success. It also creates a framework that incorporates many different paths for students to demonstrate learning and comprehension. This presentation will explore how incorporating a UDL approach can lead to classroom instruction that fosters creativity and student autonomy while increasing learner motivation. Moreover, this session will provide a set of tools that you as English as a foreign language educators can use to accommodate diverse student populations ensuring that all learners can demonstrate their understanding of classroom content. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Rosa Dean David. Rosa Dean began her career teaching in Bolivia, and since then she's taught in Colombia, Mexico, South, America, South Korea, and the United States. Rosa is currently a professor at, in the Department of Foreign Languages and Cultures at Universidad de la Sabana in Chia, Colombia, where she teaches in both the undergraduate and graduate programs. She holds a Master's of Art in TESOL from Portland State University, and her research areas include supporting students with learning differences, world Englishes, critical pedagogies, rural communities, and language education, teacher and student identity, and intercultural communication. Welcome, Rosadine. We're so happy to have you here today. And I'm so happy to be here, and I hope you guys can hear me okay. How's the mic? Sounds wonderful. Good. Yeah, great. Yay. So I'm so excited to talk to you about a passion that is near and dear to my heart, which is how to support all of our learners and how to think about using UDL or universal design for learning to support our language learners in their second language acquisition. So we might as well get started. Sounds great. So we should start by probably going over what we're going to do today. So first, I'm going to define what universal design for learning is. Next, we're gonna identify the types of learners that UDL or universal design for learning can support and how it can support them. Then we're gonna have a little bit of an experience through an activity and reflect on why sometimes students struggle um, in the language classroom. We're gonna develop an understanding of these three principles that guide UDL, which are actually fairly simple to follow. So hopefully we'll have a little toolkit when we're all done. And then we're gonna explore strategies for applying the UDL principles, remember there's three, um, in our EFL classrooms. So as we move forward, we will see that we know in our language classrooms, our students face a multitude or a variety of different challenges as they learn a second language or an additional language. So I want you to take a moment and think about what types of challenges that your students face in your classrooms. So I want you to think about limitations or barriers to learning that both strong and weak students may face as they learn their second or additional language. You can go ahead and put those responses in the text box. Yeah, great. So everyone, we'd love to hear from you about your teaching context. So please let us know in the chat box, what types of learning challenges do students face in the EFL classroom? Um, I saw one person write low self-esteem. Sarah says pronunciation. Definitely. Ari says um, confidence. Let's see, a lot of people are saying lack of confidence. Um, yes. I really like the one about pronunciation and speaking. We know that English is a difficult language because of pronunciation and because it's not phonetic. So oftentimes we feel like our mouths aren't moving correctly when we're thinking about language learning. Yes. Great. And, and I see a lot of other great responses as well. Let's see. Um, I, I saw a lot of people write that their students might be shy, a lot of lack mm -hmm. of confidence. Um, Definitely. Hesitation or fear of being wrong is a, is a response that I've seen a few times. 
really great responses, everybody. Keep them coming. Keep all your comments, questions, and concerns coming. Yeah, and those are definitely, like, especially like the low self-esteem or feeling insecure about making mistakes. Even as adults, we face this, even when we become bilingual or multilingual. So I think those are really, really important comments. Um, so let's talk about what universal design for learning is. So I want to ask you, what do you think universal design for learning is? What do you know about universal design? Yeah, great question, Rosie. Let's hear from you, our audience. Um, what do you think universal design for learning is? Or I'm sure lots of you have studied this before. So let us know if you know the answer to the definition for universal design for learning. Let's see. Sadia says it might be dealing with diversity. Yes. Um, Kuniko Definitely. says learning for every student. Yes. Yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see, lots of, I see some other diversities. Uh, Baida says you, something that's like a universal rule for all classes. Um, Kiran says something about how to communicate. Um, diverse student strategies. Teaching methods to suit more learners. Global teaching. Developing the four skills. Wow, so many wonderful responses. Um, thank you guys so much for your great participation. What do you think, Rosie, of their responses? I I love these responses. They made my heart feel really full because this is my passion. So yes, all these pieces that you have just said are correct. On the next slide, we're going to see a definition. And this definition says that universal design for learning is an approach that uses a variety of teaching methods to do what? To remove barriers that students might face in the classroom while also creating equal opportunities for all students to succeed. So the idea is that we're scaffolding or we're putting the information or giving the information in a way that's accessible to everyone and then giving them multiple ways of demonstrating what they have learned and what they already know. Wonderful, and I see there's a word variety, variety of teaching methods. So I guess that means there's not just one universal or one way to teach all students, but maybe we need to have a variety of approaches. Right, and I think mm -hmm. that word sometimes, like universal, that word sometimes throws people off. They think that this is just gonna be one approach. No, what universal design is, it's taking many different teaching methods and different ways of teaching and combining them together to put together this nice little toolkit we were talking about so that we can support all of our learners. Great, Shaquille says adopted approach, which is fit for all students. Great, great, yes. excellent. So who are the learners and who would UDL serve in this context? So who are our learners? Which students does universal design for learning serve in the classroom? Who do you think? Yeah, what do you think audience? Which students does universal design for learning? Does this approach serve? Let's see, language learners, a target group, everyone, all kinds of learners. I see a lot of people saying everyone, all students. Everyone. <laughs> Is that the right answer, Rosie? Yeah, all students. You're gonna see on the next slide that universal design for learning seeks to support all students. Now, it originally started thinking about students with learning disabilities or physical disabilities, but now we see that it encompasses everyone. So we can see that it helps students with physical impairments, learning differences, maybe students with attention issues, but really it's really telling us that there's not a one size fits all way to teach. And so that just like our fingerprints, research says that learning is as diverse as our fingerprints. So if we think about it that way, we need to start thinking about how we can give information and provide support in many different ways, in a variety of different ways. Wonderful, sounds great. So I'm going to describe a student on the next slide, and I want you to think about it with your teacher hats on, okay? So you can see this guy I have named Freddie. <laughs> All right, this is Freddie. <laughs> he's kind of cute, right? But <laughs> Freddie has a hard time in his language class, right? Sometimes he's not very motivated. Um, he might have a hard time putting together full sentences. He's a little self-conscious. He's sometimes shy but we know that Freddie really wants to learn. So what are some of the difficulties or challenges 
that Freddie might face when he's thinking of, or when we're thinking about the activities we do in our classroom. Wonderful. What, so everyone, what types of activities or parts of a language class might be difficult for Freddie? And Rosie, could you um, describe him again as people um, give yeah. their answers? So Freddie, we can even think about it in the context of the classroom. He might sit towards the back. He, um, he has a hard time focusing for long periods of time. He gets nervous when he has to speak out loud. We know he's a good kid, but like he might have a hard time putting together full sentences. He second guesses himself. Great, it and looks like we have, to... yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, it, it looks like we have a lot of great responses. Maybe group work would be difficult. Presenting a project might be hard. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, accuracy might be difficult. Maybe he might be bullied, one person said. Um, let's see, might be difficult for Freddie to talk in front of people. Pronunciation might be mm -hmm. tricky. He might feel lonely. Lots of great responses. Thanks so much, everybody, for these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful pieces of information and wisdom from your context. Have you guys ever, have, have any of you ever felt like Freddie? Maybe not in your language classes, but in other classes. I know when I first started saying languages, I was like, please don't call on me. Please don't call me. <laughs> I don't want to talk out loud. So have any of you felt this way? Yeah, let's see. Yes, many times some people are saying. Amina says, yeah, sure. Um, Victoria, lots of people saying, yes, absolutely, sure. Yeah, so Not I think a lot of people myself. can relate to this feeling. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward, we're going to do an activity that's gonna put us in the shoes of Freddie or help us remember what that feeling was, okay? So to do this activity, you're gonna to need to take out a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper. That's All right, simple. everyone, take a pencil out or a pen and a piece of paper. We'll give you uh, 30 seconds to do so. So we're about to um, do an activity that will help us all feel, remember how it feels to feel like Freddie feels sometimes. So get out a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper. And looks like a lot of people are ready. We'll give you another 15 seconds to go find it in your backpack or your purse or borrow it from your neighbor. Everyone take out a pencil and a piece of paper. All right, looks like we're ready. What are we gonna do? <laughs> I'm going to show you directions. Are you guys ready? Here are the directions. Now, I'm not going to give you a lot of time to look at these directions, okay? Because we have a really, 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 really busy day. Yeah, we have a lot to do. So, are you pretty so you're... You need them. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, if you are left handed like me, which is a very small population of the world, I know, you're going to write with your right hand. And if you're right handed, you're going to write with your left hand. That's step number one, okay? Step number two, so remember, if you're left-handed, you'll be writing with your right hand, okay? With the other hand, that's free, you're gonna cover your opposite eye. So you'll be looking like this, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so one, oops. Sorry, I was just getting my pencil and my, and my <laughs> pen out. I'm ready. Well, <laughs> You're behind, Kate. You're behind. I know, I'm way behind. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? On the next slide, I'm just gonna give you another second. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We've got a busy day, long class. In five, four, three, two, and you may begin. Remember, this is homework. Okay, and we can begin. Next slide. Okay, now remember, I'm not gonna give you very long. We don't have a lot of time to do this. As I've told you before, students, we have a lot to do today. So the sooner you get this done, the sooner we can move on to the next activity. Okay, are you ready? Please slow down with your writing. Don't write too fast, but you need to write as fast as you can. Oh, Kate, you look distracted. I'm worried. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to finish this on time, but I'm trying my best. Well, 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 you know, <laughs> I have this huge curriculum that I have to follow and I can't just wait for every student to get it done. I'm trying my best, I promise. <laughs> How's everybody else doing? Oh, don't stop to type in the text box. We have other things to do. Right, right, right. Oh, it's difficult. Well, you know, I can send this home as homework. Too tough. 
you haven't even seen tough yet. How much more time do we have? Oh, maybe like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. I don't know. I'm a busy teacher. I wasn't really timing this. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. I just saw someone write, do you think your teacher's being mean? Impatient? <laughs> Very difficult. Well, you might need to practice your writing at home more often. Hmm. More homework, it looks like. Hurting the eyes. Well, just focus, focus, focus. Okay, I think, I think we need to wrap this up. Finish up your last word. Finish up your last word. And you can, are you guys ready? Let's change the slide. Oh my goodness. Please put down your pen or your pencil. That was, that was not easy, Rosie. That was really I, difficult. I didn't nothing is supposed to be easy. <laughs> no, okay. So I want, okay, I'm going to stop being mean. That's always hard for me. I want you to take a minute, stretch your hands out because they might be sore, relax, take a deep breath, and I want you to start thinking about how you felt, okay? On the next slide, we have our first question for you. The first thing is, I want to know if anyone was able to copy the whole text, right? In the amount of time that I gave you. I and wasn't. If not, I want you to tell oh, us. I see a lot called. of people saying, nope, 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 not me. First line only. Nope, nope. I couldn't. Um, impossible. Lack of full concentration. Only two lines. Only one sentence. It was not normal for me. It was too time consuming. Thumbs down. <laughs> a lot of people are like me and couldn't make it through the whole text. Right. Now I want you to think about, and we're going to talk about how we feel, but I want you to think about some of the barriers for the student that may have come up, right? So remember, we're putting ourselves in Freddie's shoes. We could see that maybe the directions weren't clear enough. The teacher rushed through the directions. Maybe there was only one way to complete this activity. Um, there wasn't a lot of support in the classroom. And I know that every once in a while, all of us are guilty of rushing through an activity because we know we have a lot to cover, right? So on the next slide, here's our next question for you. How did this activity make you feel? Anxious, right. felt like a loser, oh, um, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> disappointed, terrible, not interested. Yeah, so you lost motivation, right? Like, like Freddie, someone said I felt like Freddie. I, I felt like Freddie too when I did this activity, and I think it's important to reflect on this as teachers. Why? Because when we do not differentiate, or um, think about supporting our students and designing activities where there's more than one way to demonstrate learning. Sometimes we lose our students and they lose their motivation, right? We need to think about how we can provide information in a way that supports everyone. Um, would you be a motivated learner if you were in this situation? Nope. Okay, so yeah, it looks like a lot of and Victoria says no. Are there strategies to help this student? Yes, and that's what we're moving towards. Thank you. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, and before I forget, on the next slide, I have one more question for you. Does e anyone even remember what they were reading while they were writing? I don't no. remember anything. I remember I wrote the word it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. So. So very few people probably remember any of it or even had time to read the whole text. So let's look at what we're actually reading. You guys ready? So it oh, says- Oh, wow, this is so much more clear. Yeah, so first of all, the presentation's better, right, of what we're seeing on the screen. And it says a core concept of the UDL approach is that educational institutions need to reduce the barriers that impede access to materials while at the same time providing flexibility in how students achieve their goals. So what do I mean by this? How they demonstrate that they're learning, right? We, uh, we give them the opportunity to start thinking about their interests and who they are as learners so that they gain autonomy. And what I mean by autonomy is independence in their learning 
so that they have more motivation in the classroom, right? So in the second paragraph, it says, the universal design approach allows instructors to think differently about teaching. Why? Because it removes the focus from the individual learner and his or her ability to master the material and instead requires instructors to provide a variety of acceptable formats <clears throat> excuse me, through which each student may engage in the material and with the material. So we're gonna start talking about this, but before, so we have to start, we have to go deeper into what universal design for learning is. So on the next slide, you're gonna see a quote and you see this quote, and I think this is a really strong place to really start thinking about who our learners are. If our learners are like Freddie, what's gonna to happen to Freddie? He may not feel that he's capable or even intelligent. So when we think of the work of Albert Einstein and one of his most famous quotes, we need to remember that everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live, it, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. So one of our jobs as teachers is to reduce these barriers and to motivate students and offer them multiple ways to demonstrate their learning and their overall understanding of classroom materials both inside the foreign language or English language classroom, and also additionally into our other classes, because I know many of you teach more than one subject. So these tools you're about to see, you can apply in your English language classrooms and also in other areas as well. Wonderful, so I love this quote, and I see that other people love it too. And Mohammed said, it means that a teacher should know the barriers that students may face. Very, yeah. very good. And a lot of other people are saying that they really enjoy this quote as well. So we should keep this quote in mind when we're thinking about universal design because on the next slide, we're gonna see this image. Now I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna describe universal design for learning. I'm gonna first start by talking about the word universal. What do you think universal means? What does universal mean, everyone? What do you think? For everyone, global. A lot of people yes. saying for so, everyone, common, general, great. Yeah, for everyone, because when we're thinking about universal within our teaching context, we're thinking about developing a curriculum that's flexible and allows more than, more than our students who are in the classroom and have an easier time acquiring the language to learn, but for everyone, right? And so each learner is going to bring their different backgrounds, different skills, different strengths, and different weaknesses. Again, if you go back to research and our fingerprint, each fingerprint is as different as our learning skills. So we have to think about each person, their fingerprint, we all learn differently. Now I wanna think about the word learning. What does learning mean? There's no one size fits all for learning, right? We all learn differently. And that we know that there are three broad areas in which we learn. The first is that we understand information, right? So how we start learning and understanding information. The next is how we develop strategies to support learning, right? To start understanding what we're learning. And finally, how we prioritize and organize information in our brains. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So simply put, students need to gain knowledge, right? We have to make sure that they're learning. Um, they need to gain skills and enthusiasm to demonstrate to show that they're learning and demonstrate that they're learning. And we need to make sure that they have enthusiasm again and motivation in the classroom. And this is a really good place to talk about this picture. So I've been going blah, blah, blah. But let's actually talk about this picture. What is unique about this picture is the word design. If you look at this picture, you see that this building is designed to support many, many different types of people. We see that there's an elevator, a ramp. We see that there's different languages. So what would this do? Universal design, specifically the word design, is referring to creating an atmosphere, in this case a building, where many people can use, use the ramp or use the elevator so it would be good for someone in a wheelchair, but it could also be good for a person with a stroller, a baby stroller, right? It could also be good for a person with a bike, and it could be good for someone like me who's just walking in. So it can support many different people. So that is the basis of universal design. And we think about this, this is also how we should start thinking about our curriculum. Does that help? Great. 
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. As, it, as we can see in this image, um, this transportation station has a lot of different um, ways for um, passengers to enter so that it allows for people with all different um, abilities or lack of ability to enter and enjoy the service of transportation. And similarly in our classroom, we want to make sure that we have things in place for each student to be able to access um, the education that we are giving to them in each of our lessons. So great. Thanks so exactly. much. Exactly. Flexible design. So on the next slide, we will see that we need to start thinking about how we can create windows of opportunity for our students. Now, who knows the difference between um, equality and equity? This so it looks like there's a little bit of a clue of the difference here in this image. So if you want, you can also try to um, uh, define it based on what you see here, or maybe get an idea based on what you see in the image about the difference between equality and equity. So Tayaba says equality is when you treat everyone equally. Muhammad says, I think he's referring to equity, is that everyone is able to enjoy or access. Um, good, yeah, look, that sounds great. Well, I think we have, we have a lot more, but um, those are some really great ones. Okay, so let's, let's start with equality. So we're gonna see that, that this is on the left-hand side of the screen. What do we see here? We see three boxes and three people. And we see one person who's in the wheelchair isn't able to see over the line. So oftentimes when we think of equality, it's meaning everyone has the same basic opportunities. What do we see on the opposite side of the picture? We see that there is a ramp that allows the, the person who wasn't able to see previously to be a part of the process. So when we connect equity, to universal design for learning, we're able to see that everyone is supported and everyone is able to participate and benefit based on their individual needs and their individual abilities. So when we start thinking about universal design, we should think about this. If we had a student in a wheelchair, we would never ask them to go run a 5K marathon, right? We know that that would be unfair and that that would not be something that they could do. So when we think about students demonstrating their learning, we need to think about how we can build support and challenge into our curriculum. So how do we use the UDL framework to make sure learning is more accessible to everyone? That's where we're moving on the next slide. So we're gonna go over those three core principles that I told you about. Now, these three core principles are really, really important and they are the foundation of universal design. The first one is provide multiple means of representation. Now I referred to this when I was talking about learning. So this is the way in which students understand information. So teachers need to present and practice language learning content and information in a variety of ways because we all learn differently, just like that fingerprint I told you about. So when we think about this, the focus is delivering learning and content in diverse ways and to develop knowledge and skills, okay? So we're gonna go through these one by one in a second. Number two is enable and provide multiple means of action and expression. Now, what do I mean by this? Teachers enable students to engage with the content and demonstrate their learning in more than one manner, right? So we're allowing students to focus on what they know and we're allowing them not only in assessment, but in day-to-day -day activities to demonstrate what they know and we're assessing them during this process so we can see how they're learning and we're supporting them in this process. Number three, is support multiple means of engagement, which this ties back into motivation, which is why we're here today, right? So we know that our students have to have many different ways to mo um, motivate them. So we need to think about how we can get them motivated, how we can get them to buy into their education, right? Or have a say to build student autonomy. And what do I mean by student autonomy? So that they can understand their learning and demonstrate their learning and also explain how they're learning. So we need to think about how we can motivate our students to learn and think about 
how we can scaffold or design our classrooms different so that the teachers just not front and center because we need to foster motivation and commitment to learning in our classrooms. Are these clear so far? Yeah, very clear. And we'd love to see some more examples coming up. Okay, so we're gonna start with number one. What was that principle again? So provide multiple means of representation. So I want you to notice that on the left, you're gonna see three boxes, right? And we're gonna start with providing access. So when we think about providing access, we need to think about how we're gonna present language learning information different ways. Now I'm giving you a very, very simple um, example with this one, but we're gonna go into a more detailed example in a second on the next slide. So this example is we could watch an English language movie or a English language clip of some sort, a YouTube video, a short video um, with English subtitles on so that students are getting two types of input. They're able to listen and read at the same time. So maybe they have a hard time understanding some of the pronunciation of the speaker or the speaker speaking very fast, like I can sometimes. How can Great. we also yeah. have another way to understand it? That makes sense. So with our first principle, everybody, we have to think about how we're presenting the information to our students. And in this example, um, Rosa Dean has shared that one way we can provide better access, just one example, is by showing a movie so people can listen and see, uh, showing a movie with subtitles so people can listen and see the words at the same time. That's just one example of a way to give two ways or multiple means of representation. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I saw a comment of some, someone asking, what about documentaries and stories? And I would say, yes, anything you want to use, just as long as you're connecting more than one way of obta obtaining this information and connecting it to learning. You're going to see next that we're going to provide guided practice and support. So how are we going to do this? Would you go ahead and click on the next? Perfect. So we need to think about how, oops, up one. We need to think about how to clarify and illustrate concepts with multimodal input. What do I mean by multimodal input? Well, this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. It's combining listening and speaking, reading and writing together, right? Not so it's as overwhelming as what we just had in that activity, but where they can really start seeing things. So we could talk about if we have kinesthetic learners or learners who like to move through the actions, how can we also have physical movements in our classroom? How can we get them engaged in more with the material in more than one way? And finally, we need to think about how we can um, encourage independence. So we need to think about how we can activate background knowledge, what students already know, and highlight patterns and relationships. Now, this is specifically important when we think about grammar and vocabulary, right? And so oftentimes teachers believe that they shouldn't give explicit grammar rules. I kind of disagree with this because we need them to recognize the patterns and see them with their language learning. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, in this case, we're asking, we want to show um, students the patterns and relationships. That might work for some students. It might not work as well for others. We also want to make sure that we're activating their background knowledge. So we want to be able to share, okay, how does this connect to something that you've already learned? And then how, what sort of patterns do you see um, in the different activities um, that we've been doing in the classroom? So I right. like to think about this as like driving a bus, a school bus maybe, right? We've, we've got to look in our rear view mirrors, you know, those little mirrors on the side to make sure when students are getting on and off the bus and when they get off, we need to make sure we pause and stop and that we, reiterate or repeat the information that, that might have been hard for them and then we keep going on our little bus of learning so i really like that analogy for it so on the next slide you oops oops can you go back i guess i forgot the goal <laughs> and the goal is to develop oof, <laughs> the goal is to develop knowledgeable learners who have who de, while we're developing these knowledgeable learners we're also teaching them autonomy right we're teaching them who they are as learners and how to describe who they are because they're going to be able to find the ways in which that they thrive in the classroom the ways in which they're actually really able to attain the information and when they go on to other classrooms hopefully they'll be able to share with their teachers look i was i, I had a hard time with this but if you help me learn this way 
I'll be able to demonstrate my learning this way. And I've seen this a lot with universal design. Great. So and I think that's, that's great. Helping our students to understand their own learning processes really helps them um, to be successful in the future. So great. Yay. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about how we can start thinking about these multimodal, multi-sensory ways of teaching and learning, right? So we know, again, that all of our learners learn differently and that we need to incorporate many different ways to present information. I like to think about how we need to connect our ears, our eyes, our hands, and our body movements to things. So auditory, we're connecting our ears. Visual, we're connecting our eyes. And tactile, we're learning how to use our hands to mold and touch things. And kinesthetic, we're able to move through the actions of learning. And when we combine these along with those lovely skills that we're so fortunate to have in our classrooms because we teach communicatively, which is listening, speaking, writing, and reading, we're really able to develop a classroom in which everyone has not only the right to learn, but everyone can succeed in the instruction because we're able to present information in more than one way. Great. Yeah, these are, this, these are wonderful reminders of how we can make sure that our learning is focusing on each different skill set that our students might have. What about visual support? What do you think, Rosie? So I'm about to go into visual support in a second with um, doing some activities, with the reading activities, but I think any way you can connect your eyes, I think oftentimes photographs for the visual learners. I also like to think about how I can use, like let students draw. For instance, when I have students who may have a learning difference like ADHD, I love to let them go draw on the board. Why? Because they're going to learn from their tactile movements and also because they're very kinesthetic and those are going to give visual representations to the other students. So the more ways that we connect our eyes to materials, the better. Great. On the next slide, let's see another. Yeah, let's, take a, let's move on and take a look at these um, ways we can provide visual support to our students. So when we're thinking about visual support, we can think about how we can connect it to listening, right? So I always say when you're teaching reading, for instance, we should try to connect it more than one way. Now, I know this is hard, and sometimes we don't have all these tools, so you'll see that I've thought of three different ways to do this. One is with audio books, right? Students can put the headphones on or we can play it for the whole class. You know, the CD, the tape, um, AmericanEnglish.gov has many wonderful materials for this and I've used them to connect to reading. We also can use free text-to-speech software. So let's say we don't have this book, but we can literally copy and paste in information to a, into a reader and we'll read it out loud. They're starting to have more natural speech text that you can find for free. But finally, if you don't have access to any of those, peer reading, literally, that is, and that's my all-time favorite. I like to think about how I can get students who are really confident and comfortable reading out loud to read to other students, sometimes in pairs, sometimes in small groups. I also try to really focus on the students who are comfortable doing this instead of making students who may suffer when reading out loud. Great. Like I did when I was first learning to read. Yeah, we have a lot of great comments, too, from the... Um Participants, let's see, Sahir says that they, for vocabulary development, they use Pictionary. Um, yes. Shabana says that they use a lot of flashcards and picture books. Um, so yes. wonderful, excellent. Um, yeah, I love these. Great ideas from our participants as well. Keep them coming, everybody. Yeah, and I agree that, again, not all of these are gonna work for every context, but again, peer reading is a great one. Free text-to-speech. There's so many free applications for this and you can download them and you do not have to have an internet connection for many of these. Just Great. to keep that in mind. How about principle number two, enabling multiple yeah. means of action and expression? Yes. So again, let's start with providing access. We need to offer different paths to achieve the same goal. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, you're gonna see it says variety of response formats. This means how can students demonstrate learning in different ways, right? So, oh, we're not All right, gonna so have for a principle one. two, we're talking about, we're giving them lots of ways to express what they know and to do things in the classroom. So the first principle was exactly. presenting it as if I'm the student, how am I receiving the content? And principle number yes. two is how am I acting on the content and expressing what I learned? 
Exactly. Right. So first teacher, how the teacher is demonstrating and teaching. Next is how do the students demonstrate what they know, right? So we have to give them access. So we need to think about how they're going to how they're going to demonstrate what they know. Do they all have to take a quiz the same way with a fill in the blank? Maybe not. Right. We can differentiate how we do that. So, for instance, in this example, you see one student might choose to take a if we're talking about grammar, excuse me, one student might choose to take a written exam or test while another might choose to have an oral presentation to demonstrate what they know and what they've learned because they're more comfortable speaking while another one might be more comfortable writing. Great example. Yeah, we might think about how we're going to provide guided support and practice, which could be on the next illustration. We could offer learners different ways to know what they know, right? So how are they going to show us? And not just an assessment when we're giving them an exam or a project, but every day. And so how are we going to design our information so they have practice and performance together? So how are we really going to connect those pieces? And then how are we going to encourage independence? Well, if you see, we're going to offer planning and strategy development, right? And help them learn how to set goals. So great. let's think yeah, about we this. Saw a lot of other great responses as well. So one participant said, this is putting responsibility on the students by choosing their own medium for learning and presenting. I love that. Um, yeah. And as um, Jubaida said, another idea might be storytelling. I think she was referring to your first example. And Iran yes. said um, uh, that different tests or different ways of assessing mentioned um, measure different skills. So that's a really good point as well. So thanks so much for yeah. all of your responses, everyone. Oh, I love these. They're so good. Okay, so on the next slide, you'll see some more information about this because, again, we have to develop confident learners. So we know, again, that all of our students learn a multitude of different ways, many different ways. So why shouldn't we give them choices? And I like to think about this, as you'll see on the next slide, like ordering a pizza. All okay, right. Now, thinks of analogies silly. But have you ever gone out to dinner with a group of your friends or maybe your family and everyone wants different toppings on the pizza? And it's really, really hard to just decide two or three toppings, right? It's really hard. So why can't we create learning like we do like the individual pizza, right? Where we all get a say and we like different flavors. Why can't we like different ways of learning? So I'm going to provide you a more concrete example in a second. But I really want you to think about this because we need to provide students with assignment options, just like we need to provide ourselves with choices for our pizza. So on the next slide, you will see an example of this. So let's say our students have a speaking assessment. Right, and we, we're gonna assign them some sort of assignment. We could do many things. They could do poster presentations. They could do podcasts or a video presentation. They could do group presentations, and they can design how they do this. They could do this one by themselves in small groups, right? Or they could even, which I didn't have room on the slide for this, they could even just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the teacher. So they get to choose how they're doing it. And they're all demonstrating their learning in different ways, in ways that make them comfortable and motivated to learn. Does this help? So this is literally the pizza analog analogy in motion. Wonderful. Dr. Baca says this means that we're focusing on the learner. This is very learner-centered. Centered. Yeah. Ahmed says so we're providing freedom for students. Aisha says we're giving them freedom to share what they have learned. Um, superb. A lot of people are saying this is really helpful. So, so wonderful. Glad. Thanks for your wonderful comments, everyone. Well, you guys are making me so happy. I feel like I'm going to tear up. Okay, so we'll move on to the third principle before I get too sad and excited. <laughs> we're going to talk about um, supporting multiple means of engagement. So do you remember when we were talking about how we need to motivate our learners and get them to buy in or invest in their learning? So we need to think about ways we can incorporate our students' interests, individual choice, and help them learn how to collaborate. Now, part of the reason I wanna focus on collaboration in this part is because we live in the 21st century and we have to develop 21st century skills which means we need to build resilient, smart kids who can overcome challenges that we cannot even dream, right? 
So we need to give them opportunities to collaborate, share their ideas in order to create a positive learning environment, but also to teach them that they are independent in their learning. And that also removes the teacher from being front and center to being a guide on the side, as many of us have heard, or to reduce teacher talk time, right? Wonderful, and yeah. We need to provide guided practice and support. How are we gonna do this? I'll show you in one second. We're gonna build teamwork and collaboration, right? And by doing this, by getting them to work together, it increases, this is the amazing part, our time to give feedback, and we can do this in a variety of different ways. The, the more time that they are talking and problem solving and working together, the more opportunities we have to listen, assess, correct, and support, okay? So when we think about this, by encouraging independence, we, are able to do many, many, many things. And you'll see on this next bullet point that it helps students learn how to self-regulate. It will help them, it will help us as teachers promote our expectations while they're developing their own motivation for learning. And they'll start being able to self-assess and reflect. Now, many teachers build in the reflection right afterwards where they make do an activity and they have a short time reflecting. And that's great. So all these tools are so wonderful. On the next slide, you will see. We have one question from a participant. Um, is with giving all of these different options in the different principles shared, does time management become an issue at all? And how have you dealt with that? So it can, I will not lie, it can. But it's also thinking about how you're gonna take the responsibility off the teacher because actually in many ways, this makes it so there's less planning by giving them more variety. So as once you become more comfortable being the guide on the side and not the teacher front and center, it becomes easy. Now, I will be honest, when I first started taking a UDL approach to my classroom, it took me a minute to figure it out. I had a really hard time brainstorming these multiple ways of teaching and developing information, but then it became very um, like second nature to me. It became very, very easy. And um, it actually has decreased the amount of time I'm planning. Wonderful. And but there's a yeah, lot so I think it, it sounds like it's a lot like when you're a novice or a new teacher, a lot of times those first few years uh, or the first few semesters, it's a lot of uh, maybe more work than it is later on, yeah. partly because you're really trying to understand how to use the new approaches. Same thing with the universal design. Um, yeah. And the... Um, I also, there was one question about um, what if I have many students in my classroom? How can oh, I take this approach? It's better. <laughs> I think universal design is a dream um, for large classrooms. I've used universal design in classrooms of 40 and 50 students, which was at a university. And it made it again, like, so they were able to, like, I was able to design the activities so that I had different ways of grading. Some of the activities were graded in class, some of them were graded outside of a class. Also gave the students more time in class to work and for me to give feedback, like I just described. It was a dream because I realized that when my classroom was quiet, learning wasn't necessarily happening. But when my classroom was loud, learning was happening. Wonderful, excellent. So as we move forward, our goal here is to develop purposeful learners. So the first thing is, how are we gonna facilitate collaboration? Well, we already all do this, group work, pair work, debates, and teamwork. The more opportunities that we give our students to work together, the more opportunity we have to assess our students, give indirect and direct feedback, and so to provide individual and, and additional types of support in the classroom. Why? Because we have that moment to walk around and students will be like, teacher, can you explain this? Instead of when you're front and center, Students are more passive, they don't ask as many questions. But when they're engaged in projects, they're like, ah, teacher, teacher, teacher. And you have this moment where they're really connecting knowledge and learning and demonstrating what they're learning. And you can help guide them instead of direct them. In their Wonderful. Learning. We have a lot of questions about the large class size. And I think facilitating collaboration, as you can see in this slide, is one way to address a large class. Sometimes students don't have an opportunity to really practice and develop their language skills in a large class, but when we put them into teams, in pair work or group work, this can often be a really wonderful time for them to learn from each other and to collaborate with each other. And that can be used even in a large class or 
um, in a class with many students. So thanks so much for sharing this, um, this information. And I think it's important to think about how you're grouping, right? You might have a student who's a really strong reader while you might have another student who is a really, who's really strong at reading but might suffer with, um, or might suffer with speaking, right? And if you, can, if you can start thinking about how you're developing your groups and how you're grouping students, that will also help them learn because then they're able to support one another in the learning process. So I oftentimes have a home group, which is the group that they work with when they first come to class. And then I have reading groups and I might have writing groups and those groups look different as we're developing different skills. And they start to learn who their partners are at different times and it also makes the class time they move faster. Okay, on the next slide, here's another, here's a strategy for teaching. And I like to think about learning stations and learning centers. Now I want you to first think that this is a great way for presenting information they may have already worked through, but they might be having a hard time with. So a learning station is literally when they're engaged in some sort of activity that's autonomous or that's independent in their group. And they have these opportunities to work through it. So it could be a game, it could be some sort of grammar exercise. And I do this a lot. I do this every time I'm reviewing information that we've already covered in class. I literally will bring envelopes to class with some activities in them, put them on the desk, have them get into their groups and have them go through this. This and that's, me and that's your version of a learning station or learning center? Yeah, that's great. Both of so, them, yeah. Great, so the example Rosie just shared is, is a demonstration of, so these images here, you know, we can see the classroom has young learners and a lot of, and a lot of resources, but even if you don't have very many resources, you could even do something simple like take an envelope or a piece of paper with some activities on it and put students into groups um, that might, they might move around the class, they might not, but th that's one way as well to do a learning station or learning center for older students or for classrooms that might not have quite as many resources. So right. great so, idea, thank you. As, as a teacher, I'm always having to move around to different classrooms because I work at a university and I literally just bring it with me. Wonderful. So this helps our students develop agency and autonomy so they learn who they are as learners. Great. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of time, so I guess I should move on. So just to recap these three pr principles is we need, to um, we need to offer and provide multiple means of representation. So how we're going to teach them, how we're gonna deliver the information. Number two, we need to enable students to have multiple means of action and expression. We're gonna give them many different ways to demonstrate what they're learning and what they know. And three, support multiple means of engagement, right? So help them really connect with what they're learning and motivate them to learn by giving them choices and also allowing them to work with their peers and develop their interests. So if you start integrating these three principles in a multitude or many different ways, you will be able to support your learners. Remember, the ideas I gave you were just a few. Okay, there's many ways of doing that. So remember to keep universal design in mind because we need to think about this proverb. The reason is, if you tell me, I may forget. If you show me, I may remember. Involve me and I'll understand. And that is the basic principle of universal design, providing flexible um, learning environments for our students, so that everyone can learn. I hope that this um, webinar has been helpful and I'm here for any questions you may have. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rosadine, for helping us all gain a better understanding of understanding what universal design for learning is and for sharing your ideas for applying that um, approach to our English as a foreign language classrooms. I think that all of us really gained a lot of ideas for how we can differentiate and provide more variety and choice for our learners um, so that they can become more autonomous um, and take more ownership of their own learning. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And of course, we'd all like to share, or we'd like to thank all of you, our part audience participants, for all of your wonderful ideas um, and for how you um, shared your questions